All right, we've reached 11, so I'm going to go ahead and just get started. Uh, first, some housekeeping stuff from yesterday. All of the videos did manage to record perfectly, so uh, the only problem was that I had to manually convert them because Zoom didn't do that for me, so I didn't get a chance to upload them last night, but those will go up very soon. Uh, if you have any questions from anything that happened yesterday, you can hop on to the members only Facebook page and I've started a thread for each webinar so you can put your questions there or if you even have anything to add to the conversation. You might have something to say that I didn't think of so you can always hop on there and add your information as well. I'm going to do that again today. So for every webinar we have, I'm going to start a new thread and each thread will have all of the information for that particular webinar. Uh, I'm going to stick around a little bit afterwards for q and A. I'll also try to watch the chat throughout. So if you have something to say in the middle of the presentation, I'll try to be watching to see if I can address those things as I go. But I'll also stop at the end for a little while for a question and answer period. And then I'll hop on over to Facebook for about a half an hour after that in case anyone has any questions over there. So we went all through yesterday without any technical glitches. So I'm going to cross my fingers for the same today. Uh, tomorrow we've got thunderstorms, so that could present some issues, but we'll, we'll worry about that bridge when we get to it. And uh, if anything happens and our internet cuts out, we'll pop right back on as soon as possible. So just do the same on your end. And even though we're on to our second day, you can still share with your friends who are thinking about homeschooling. Like I said, all of these webinars are going to be recorded. So it doesn't matter if they missed yesterday or even part of today, everything will be available to that for them to watch at their leisure afterwards. So I have a lot to say on travel schooling. Traveling is something I'm really passionate about and learning through traveling is something I'm very passionate about. So I'm going to try to keep this into our time limit. Uh, I'll rein myself in a little bit, but this is something that I think is really important for children getting those experiences and when i say traveling you don't have to spend a bunch of money or go far there's lots of things to do right within your own community which is especially relevant now i do understand the irony of doing this presentation while in the middle of a pandemic when we're not actually allowed to go anywhere uh, i would say that this is probably the longest period of time that i can remember where i haven't traveled anywhere significant, like anywhere outside of my own local area. Uh, I've been traveling since I can remember. If it wasn't, you know, with my own children, I was in choirs and orchestras and bands, and we did a lot of traveling that way as a child. So lots of traveling in my past, lots of traveling in my future, not so much traveling in my present, <laughs> but we're still going to go ahead and learn about that today. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. And just let me know in the chat that you can see that. I'm always paranoid that it's not going to uh, it's not going to show up. Awesome, thank you so much, Jody. So we're just gonna go ahead then. So travel schooling, I, I say that we can leverage traveling wherever you go as an unparalleled learning opportunity. So I really can't say enough good things about travel as an amazing way to learn, but I will say a lot of good things as we go along today. Uh, I place a lot of value on what we call experiential learning. So think back to your time in school. I think I said this yesterday as well. Do you remember all of the worksheets that you did? Or do you remember the field trips, the science labs, the exciting projects that your teachers gave you? Travel schooling allows for experiences like those at every turn. So you'll, I'm gonna talk about the pictures as we go too, because all of these are interesting things that we've done. Uh, obviously the top one there, you'll see that we're in New York City. If you ever go there or any other major city, you can get city passes for that place. And so the New York City Pass allowed us entry into hundreds of places and also hop on, hop off bus 
access. So we were able to do all of these awesome things at one really low price. So I would suggest if you're going to any major city, you check and see if they have some sort of city pass. Just type in the city that you're going to and city pass. And it might not be the official city pass that you come up with depending on the city, but you'll usually find something. We do the same sort of thing when we go to Niagara Falls, we get some sort of pass there as well that covers a whole bunch of things. We go there often, so we we switch up which one we get, but there are basically anywhere you're going to go, they have something like that. Uh, the, the other two photos here are from the Museum of Early Trades and Crafts, which was a tiny little museum that we came across just kind of organically as we were traveling. But this museum, I think, really has a strong grasp on experiential learning for children. So a lot of museums, you're walking through, you're looking at the stuff, you're reading the plaques, and that's all great. There's, there's a lot to be learned there too. I usually try to take it up a notch and add something into that. But this museum went ahead and did that on their own. So you can see that the kids are touching things in these photos. And every single exhibit at this place had like little drawers that pulled out that had things that the children could actually handle. They could go ahead and patch together a quilt. They could do some sewing. They could feel the dolls that were from that era. They could use a heavy iron. And then the one where the little blonde is holding the tag, that's Dahlia. And the other thing that they had there, which I thought was a really great integration, but you could do this on your own as you're traveling, is they had these little tags at every station and you could write down what exhibit was your favorite and why and then stick it in a little slot for other people to read. So I thought that was a really interesting way to kind of get feedback from the children but also to give them a, a kind of an English integration. So that was kind of fun. But I would say you could also do that at any museum and just keep a journal. <clears throat> So I know that me telling you to travel for school comes from a bit of a place of privilege. I have a job that's very flexible, so I can travel and make my own hours. And not everyone has the time or money to travel, but there are lots of ways to travel cheaply. And you can travel in short spurts. So there's, there's always a way. Uh, but if your lifestyle allows for regular travel, there's so much to be gained for children in the process, I think. And for adults, I learn a lot too <laughs> as, we, as we travel. So I'm going to tell you today about how we make our constant travels a vehicle for learning and how we do it might not be the way that will work for you, but if you take away even one helpful tip, then you're ahead. When I, when I listen to webinars myself, I always say if I learn one new thing that I can use moving forward, then it's been worth my time. So normally we travel from, like regularly, from the time spring hits, so around April uh, straight through until fall and we're usually gone at least a couple of weeks out of each of those months doing something so we do travel a lot and we would travel more if we had, if we had the money to do so let me be honest uh, but one of the things that we do because we travel so much uh, we also travel back and forth to Toronto which is about four and a half hours away from where we are because the girls act so we're in the car a lot whether it's for our regular travels or for our regular activities, we spend a lot of time in the car. So we make use of that travel time by doing what we like to call car schooling. Now, lucky for us, none of the children get car sick, so they're able to read and do activities in the car. I know that's not the same for everyone. Uh, so there will be some children who this will not be applicable to, but uh, one thing I don't have on here for our car schooling that the kids have picked up recently that I'd like to add so I don't forget about it is small games that travel well. So I, I did my game schooling presentation yesterday and I really think games are a great way to learn. And we've found some that travel really well and they're able to play on a seat in between them or it's hands of cards and they put out like a little table in between them. So they're, they've they found ways to adapt and actually game in the car too. So that's also an option. So the most obvious one is workbooks and reading. Uh, this is our, our way of making use of really long drives. We actually don't do a lot of physical workbooks at home. A lot of the girls' work is done online. But when we travel, we take our workbooks. I have a workbook for their particular grade. And that's what they do when we're on the road. Because we don't always know when we'll have access to the internet. We certainly don't have access to the internet in our car. I know some people do. 
but we don't. So we make use of those long drives by doing some of our workbook work. Now, of course, this is where you have to beware of car sickness. Uh, the kids also do a lot of reading in the car. Sometimes they'll read a whole entire book on a trip, so that's fun. Uh, and we've also even brought audiobooks with us. So we did, I think, half of the Chronicles of Narnia series just on our trip to the World Board Game Championships a couple of years ago. So having those options available is great. And that also gives us a chance to talk about the books as a family afterwards because we've all listened to them together. We also have done some interesting projects as we travel. So we typically in May do a long trip somewhere, usually to somewhere in the northern states that we can easily access. And last year, we incorporated some projects that spanned the whole entire time we were traveling. So we did some graphing projects where every day the girls were tallying how many birds of each type they saw on our drive. And then we compiled that all by how many birds of each type were in each state and made graphs later. We did one where we were checking off how many of each license plate we saw in each day. Uh, and then we also, when we were at the uh when we were at the water park we did a graphing project too but that wasn't in the car but the other thing we did that was a daily thing was journals so we each girl had a book of their own that they could write in and every day we had them write a little snippet about the previous day and their favorite part and draw a picture and it got them writing every day and just kept up that writing so they weren't losing their momentum another thing that we do is quizzes. So we have a lot of quiz books, uh, a lot of quiz cards that we buy even from the dollar store, the Dollar Tree, and the girls make their own quizzes for each other, which is a lot of fun. Uh, but that's something that we sort of do on the road as review. And it it's actually kind of a fun thing to do as a family. <laughs> so <laughs> I think one of the one of the most interesting times I've seen quizzing in action as we were traveling is when we hadn't done math for about 24 hours and one of the girls started making up math questions to quiz all of the other girls with so so the the quizzes are fun i would recommend buying uh either a book from national geographic has a couple of books uh, dk has a couple of books that are just big quiz books so buy a book that you can keep in the car if you're traveling a lot uh, or buy a couple of sets of cards i tend to find them at the dollar tree but uh, they have them all over. So I'll, I'll post some links to some of my favorite quiz resources. We also do a lot of unit studies in the car or work on a lot of unit studies in the car via media or other sources. So one trip that we took, we ended up kind of by mistake, it wasn't really intentional, but we ended up doing a whole entire unit on uh, early settlers on prairie times because we were watching Little Hosts on the Prairie we happened to go to a couple of farm museums uh, and it sort of snowballed into a whole unit study. So watch for things that your children are interested in before you start traveling. Would My, my advice would be to try to make it intentional. Uh, and then you can grab documentaries and resources, books to go along with whatever you think they might be interested in and make use of all that time stuck in the car. I mentioned documentaries, we do a lot of documentaries while we travel. Uh, so typically if we're going somewhere short, we pop over to the library, we pick a couple of documentaries that might be interesting, and we watch those as we travel. We even do that in our in-city travel. We have a documentary that's running, and if we're going 15 minutes to jujitsu, we'll watch 15 minutes of our documentary on the go. So that kind of fills in the little bits of downtime. You don't want to be like on all the time while you're traveling. And certainly if you're doing an eight hour day of driving, which we, we try to reduce our days to shorter than that. But if you're doing a long day of traveling, you don't want to be, the kids don't want to be sitting and reading a book or doing something where they're looking down that whole entire time. So we do put our documentaries in there. We have a built-in DVD player, but you can also get fairly cheap ones that just strap to the back of the seats. And then of course, emergent curriculum. I really like emergent curriculum which is basically you know watching what opportunities you have for learning as you go and creating the curriculum as it emerges um i have a whole other 
webinar on that because I think it's a really exciting thing to do. But watching for emerging curriculum is really important. Watch for opportunities for learning. I couldn't even tell you the number of times where we've come across some sort of thing that is interesting and then gone down a rabbit hole learning about that as we travel. The, the prairie thing was kind of a, an interesting uh, an interesting one of those, but there's been many. Like we, something will come up and then the kids will want to know more and we just keep going and going, learning about that. And while you're stuck in a car and have Google in front of you is a great time to do that. So when should you travel for the best experience? Now we homeschool, so there's a little bit more flexibility. I like to travel when the other kids can't travel. <laughs> so going on the off months when kids are still in school and on the off days when people aren't typically out in the middle of the day, we often will go to a museum and have it entirely to ourselves. So going on the days that are usually a little bit slower would be my advice. Now, you do have to contend with school groups sometimes, but the trick that we've figured out is that if you go after 1.30, typically the school groups are gone because they have to get back to class. <laughs> so if you want your ideal time to go to a museum, you're gonna wanna go in the middle of the school year, in the middle of the week, around the middle of the afternoon, <laughs> and then you're not going to have to be around a whole bunch of other people, you essentially get whatever place you're at to yourself. And that has led to some really interesting learning for us. We went to a museum in New York State, uh, another one of those things where we just sort of had an extra half a day and Googled what was nearby. And we ended up at an old farm museum with some of the buildings from that area uh, that were from you know the early 1900s or late 1800s. And we had that whole entire museum to ourselves. I think we, we ran across one other homeschooler while we were there, but it made for really interesting engagement because every building that we went into, the interpreters had nothing else to do but talk to us. <laughs> so the kids learned probably 10 times more than they would have otherwise because everyone was really incredibly engaged with them. So definitely, if you have the ability to, schedule your travel around when school children are not traveling because then you're going to have a little bit more of an in-depth experience at each place. So speaking of museums, if you were around yesterday, I mentioned this in our homeschooling on a budget, but reciprocal agreements are pretty much my favorite thing ever and a tip that I give to everyone. I think I even have a blog post uh, on the website about reciprocal agreements because I feel like I need to shout it from the rooftops because not enough people know that it is a thing that exists. So if you buy one membership, you're basically getting endless fun. Uh, you can buy one membership to say your whole science center. Like here in Ottawa, we have the Ingenium Pass. So it gets you into the three museums here. But what a lot of people don't realize is that it also gets you into all of the other science centers everywhere, essentially. Basically, the Association of Science Centers has an agreement with each other that if someone has a membership to one, they can get into all of them. So we've used our science center pass in our hometown less than we have in other places. We've gone to the Ontario Science Center, which is ludicrously expensive for all of us uh, but we've gone there for free dozens of times we travel to halifax regularly and we've gone to the discovery center there we've gone to uh, museums in new york and new jersey and basically everywhere we go we look and see if there's a science center nearby that we can go to for free and the answer is almost exclusively yes there's always something that we can go to uh, we I actually really loved the math museum, which is pictured here up in the corner where the girls are pulling themselves along. That was sort of one that was on that reciprocal agreement with the science centers. And we were going to New York City and I thought, well, you know, we have this pass, I should look and see what museums are included. And I seem to remember from the last time we went there that it was kind of all the second tier museums, in my opinion, <laughs> that were included in the, in the reciprocal agreement in New York. 
but I thought, well, you know what, I'm just going to look just in case. And I saw the math museum and I thought, wow, that looks so boring. Why would anyone go to a math museum? And I like math. So, <laughs> but I thought, you know, it's, it's only responsible to at least look at their website and see what it's like. And oh my gosh, that place is amazing. The whole entire thing is all individual exhibits for learning math in a hands-on way. It's phenomenal. And their gift shop is great. We've got a whole bunch of game, math games from there and workbooks and stuff. But, but the museum itself is great. So if you ever make it to New York City, if we're ever allowed out of our country again, uh, this, is, this is a great place to go. So there's the, the Science Center Reciprocal Agreement. There's also one for the Association of Zoos and Aquariums. That one doesn't get you into everywhere for free, but it does give you a discount. Uh, there is the Six Flags Pass. So if you buy a pass to one Six Flags Park, it lets you into all of the Six Flags Parks. And I, I could go on and on about this, but I won't. Uh, that's probably the thing that we use the most often to save money. We figured out at one point when we, gone through a year of our pass that with all the museum trips that we've made our science center pass every trip that we went to a museum it cost us less than a dollar a person so that's insane if you think about how much it would cost for a family of six to go to just let's say the Ontario Science Center once so another thing that you can do when you go to museums or virtually anywhere is uh, there's a lot of extra learning to be had for free by riding on the backs of the school programs. <laughs> so that sounds a little funny. You can book a school program and we've certainly done that with lots of places. We'll call ahead of time and say, you know, we're coming into town and we'd like to book a school program. What's your minimum number of students? And usually it's not going to be four, <laughs> which is what we have. Now we have five, but one's a baby, so we wouldn't pay for him anyways. Uh, but what you can do is figure out what the price would be and pay for that if you have a little bit of extra money. But also what you can do is go into the museums and simply ask if they have materials that they give to school groups. So usually they'll have like a scavenger hunt throughout the museum or worksheets to do. And that's what you see pictured here. This is two different museums. We have uh, the Black Cultural Center in Dartmouth, Nova Scotia. And we did actually book a school group there, uh, but they also gave us these scavenger hunts to go through the museum and fill in a different, they had different questions that you had to really read through the exhibits to find the answers. So that was a lot of fun. And then the Welland Canal Museum on the right had a similar thing. We just asked if they had any materials that they would normally give up to school groups that we could use. And they had a nice little booklet that was a scavenger hunt all throughout the museum. So it got us engaging with all of the exhibits, some that we might not even have stopped to look at. So always ask. And of course, traveling gives us great opportunities for unit studies. Uh, watch what your kids are interested in or lead them in the right direction if you have an idea of what you want them to be learning. But there are always things that are going to pop up that you might not expect. Like we, we travel to Six Flags a fair amount. We have a Six Flags pass. We didn't get one this year and thank goodness we didn't because now we can't use it. Uh, but we actually emailed ahead of time and this kind of goes back to the last thing as well, asking for materials. I know that Six Flags hosts a school program in the spring. They have people come in for a math and physics day. They have a handout that they give to students and they go and figure out math and physics pro problems throughout the park while going on rides and so I thought well we don't really want to necessarily join on for the school program but we would like to do that while we're traveling because we're traveling in the middle of the school year so I just emailed them and asked for the packet they would give out to the school programs because we couldn't make it during that time and they gave it to us so that started us on a little mini physics unit as we went to Six Flags that year and these are all photos from the the Pioneer Museum I told you about that uh, we really got to go in depth because as you can see we were literally the only ones there <laughs> so the kids got to you know watch the printing press pick what they wanted on it talk to the blacksmith uh, we got to go in and milk the cows and it was it was really quite an experience to be there all on our own
what I like to do too in places that don't specifically have those, you know, scavenger hunts or things for children to engage in is create my own. So this is at Fisherman's Cove in Eastern Passage, Nova Scotia. And there's a lot to be seen there. They have a little museum. They have all kinds of really cool plaques all through Fisherman's Cove. So you can learn about the history and the ecology of the area. Uh, but I went to the little museum and asked if they had anything that they could give to us that they would normally give to school groups or people who are traveling and they actually didn't have anything. So I went down the day before and created one myself and actually just gave it back to them as well. So they had it available. So that's something that you can do too. If you have a little bit of extra time, if you know that you're going somewhere that doesn't have something available, you can plan ahead to make something yourself, either do it ahead of time or add in a little extra time as you're traveling. There's also an interesting thing that you might want to look up called math trails. So a lot of places will have what they call math trails and it's basically an experiential learning through math that people have created. This is a, a teacher created thing mostly. So you'll find them on teachers pay teachers and that sort of thing. So if you're going somewhere, you could also look up math trails for that place. So I would like to extol the virtues of flexibility while you're traveling. I know this isn't always possible. I mean, we, we are flexible in the sense that we don't fill every single day ahead of time, but we do know exactly where we're sleeping ahead of time. So we, we plan out our accommodations and we don't necessarily plan every single activity before we get to where we're going. Uh, we, we usually have one or two things that we're specifically going for. Like our last May trip, we really wanted to go to New York to go gem digging. So the, the Herkimer, Herkimer Diamonds, which is really just quartz, uh, but they have a little digging spot in Herkimer, Herkimer, New York. Uh, and we knew we wanted to go there and we specifically had that planned. We knew we wanted to go back to New York City and we knew that we missed Central Park the last time. So we thought we would go there, but we didn't have any other specific plans. So because of that flexibility, we've actually found some of our best experiences sort of on the fly. Normally a day or two before we get to where we're going, I will kind of Google what's interesting in that area, look for museums along the way on Google Maps. We, I'll tell you about the ones that I have pictured here. I've talked about the Museum of Early Trades and Crafts a lot, uh, so I won't talk about that again, but that's one of these photos. That place was amazing, and if you have a chance to go there, definitely do. Uh, the one with the blue in the background, that was a National Geographic experience in New York City. I found a Groupon because I like to save money, uh, and it basically took you on an underwater experience through sort of projections and sounds and it was very immersive and really really cool I had no idea that was there before we went I just literally went on Groupon and looked for experiences because I knew we were going to New York City a couple of days later <laughs> so that was really great and again something that we didn't plan for it was just sort of an on-the-fly thing and then we have the girls in backpacks down on the bottom that was a day that we had an extra half a day while traveling I looked for tiny museums along the way and found this little place that was a farm museum that also had like a reptile house. They had an exhibit on guitars. They had a really interesting gift shop, but they also had these backpacks that were explorer backpacks for kids. Again, one of those ask if they have anything for school programs. So they had these little explorer backpacks where the kids went out and learned different things all throughout their whole entire museum. So be flexible if you can and look for things along the way. Now, with that said, there are probably 20 different things that I have written down just in the areas that we've been to that we didn't have time to go to because you can't be too, too flexible. You need to know where you're laying your head, uh, or at least we do. And so some flexibility is great. The more flexibility you can have, the more interesting experiences you're going to stumble upon, I think. So 
here's something that is a little bit sad, <laughs> but but true that I feel like I should warn you about. Now, I've told you to go out and travel in the middle of the week, in the middle of the day. People will probably question why your kids aren't in school, and that's fine. We're used to that as homeschoolers. But occasionally we end up somewhere on the weekend and we're still learning. So you'll see part of that physics packet I talked about at Six Flags where we were doing one of our math projects. On that trip, we were standing in line, and this is not the only time this has happened, but this is the one that really stands out to me. We were standing in line and we were doing some math in the line on our little packet. So, I mean, I understand what that looks like to people. I brought my kids to an amusement park and now I'm standing in line making them do math. <laughs> and, but there was a lady in front of us who just was glaring daggers at us the whole entire time. Uh, and I, if I wasn't busy doing math, I would have engaged her and talked to her and kind of tried to flip her to the, the pro-learning side. But she was not impressed. She had a little girl with her. I don't know if maybe she was mad that we were learning and maybe... <laughs> she thought that she was going to want to learn too but we that is not an isolated incident people will look at you funny when you're out learning in the middle of the day or in the middle of the weekend um, just learn to live with it or be excited to answer questions because that's another thing that will happen it's not always dirty looks sometimes it's just really interested looks so we have a photo down there of us out with steve brill who is a uh, a forager he's written lots of books on wild edible plants and he's uh, he's been on tv he's a fantastic person and very knowledgeable when we knew we were going to new york and knew we were going to central park it kind of clicked in my brain that i thought that he was from that area so i found his website and emailed him and asked him if he'd be willing to do a central park tour for us because i knew that that was something he'd done in the past and so he came out and did that and he is a very he has a very vibrant personality like he's a very big personality so as we were out learning about plants with him uh we were drawing a lot of attention <laughs> so, and lots of people would kind of peek in and or come by and ask what we were doing so in those cases when people are genuinely interested it's a lot of fun to explain to them that we're homeschooling and we're out learning and seeing us out having fun learning, I think has actually uh, softened the idea of homeschooling for a lot of people along our travels. While we're on the topic of Steve Brill and Central Park, that's another great place if you ever make it there to ask for resources. Uh, nature centers are great. And Central Park has a whole bunch of visitor centers. So anywhere that has a visitor center essentially, uh, pop into that visitor center and see if they have free learning materials because Central Park had one at every visitor center and if you know how large that place is that's a lot they had at least one some had several and it was these neat little booklets that were all on the animals or the plant life or the art or like basically every subject you could think of was in these books somewhere so you could spend an entire, an entire week there and be covering every subject. It was really quite an interesting find. We only had a couple of days, so we didn't even get through a fraction of them. But that's definitely something to do if you live in the area or if you're just visiting. So I'm going to tell you about some of our favorites. Now, there are a million things that you can do while traveling. You'll notice that a lot of my favorite things that I mentioned are centered in the New York, New Jersey area um, or the northern states because that's where we've made it to the most that's not right in our immediate area. Um, but there are a few gems that really stand out. I've mentioned that Museum of Early Trades and Crafts lots of times, so please nobody forget that because that was really cool. Um, near to here, we have the Glengarry Pioneer Museum. And we had a lot of fun there and their school programs are really well priced and really engaging for the students. Herkimer Diamond Mines is in New York, in upstate New York. And we had an amazing time there digging. We had the whole place to ourselves because it was a gross rainy day. 
it was in May. It was supposed to be warm, but it was in fact so cold that I almost wasn't going to go. And I told the kids that and they said, no, no, we still want to go. Even though it was cold and rainy, it was probably six degrees and <laughs> drizzling two pouring buckets, depending on the time of day. And I told them, fine, we can go. But I really don't want to hear any complaining because you made this choice. <laughs> and I gave them out points throughout the day. We were only staying across the street. So, and we had multiple adults with us. So I just, every couple of hours would say, you know, would anyone like to go back to the cottage? Okay, it's lunchtime. Would you like to stay here? Would you like to go back? You know, we gave them oak points, but I was really impressed that it was such an engaging activity that they actually didn't want to leave, even though the conditions were brutally awful. And this place also has a little museum as well that kind of teaches you about the rock cycle and about rocks. So that was, that was interesting in itself, but the actual experience of going out and digging for things was really engaging and interesting and probably something that they'll never forget. And then down on the bottom there where we have someone driving is Diggerland. So I guess you could argue that this is not really particularly educational, but if you have a kid that's interested in construction, this is the place to be. <laughs> so this place is in New Jersey and it is an amusement park that is entirely based around construction vehicles. Every single ride is either an actual construction vehicle that you're operating or an old construction vehicle with seats welded to it made into an amusement ride. It sounds ridiculous and it is, but ridiculous in the best way possible. So, so Dahlia is really interested in construction. And a couple of years ago for Christmas, because they have a sale in December. So if you want to go there, watch in December for their flash sale where tickets are half price. And we bought this for her for Christmas and then went the following spring. And it we've been to so many amusement parks, like dozens of amusement parks. And this by far was my favorite. It, I love the theming. It was so unique. You're never going to see anything like it. So if you have a child who is particularly interested in construction, definitely go to Diggerland and watch for that flash sale in December if you want to save some money. So of course I'm sitting here talking to you about travel but we're actually in a time where we're not allowed to travel <laughs> so that's that's kind of a little bit strange to be doing but there is something to be said for for travel within your own community. And also there are a lot of virtual travel experiences. So we'll talk a little bit about both of those. Um, in this summer issue of our magazine, I have a whole couple of pages on different museum trips or trips to parks that you can take that are virtual travel experiences. So some of them actually are available in VR, but mostly you're going onto your computer learning about the place. It's not the same, but at least it's something. And then also uh, you have all of these places nearby that some of which are open, some of which are not, but all of those natural spaces are going to be great places that you can look at now while you're stuck close to home. For us, there are a lot of places in town that we'd never seen because we're always traveling during the times that they're open, like up in the pop corner where we're mini golfing, that place is 10 minutes from us. And we like mini golf. We've never ever, been there because we're all of the all of the time that it's open we're always gone uh we also have a couple of pictures of us down at the beach that's near our house it's literally a five minute walk and we've lived here for years and we've maybe swam there twice <laughs> so now we get to go there often the kids are doing some water testing down there with water rangers there we're going there to swim we try to pick the days when it's not busy so that we're not around anybody and uh, we're getting to kind of experience our local area in a way that we wouldn't normally. So that those are, I think, our options right now, our travel virtually, the photo in the middle is, a, is us having a luau at home, uh, travel virtually, or get out into your own community and do things that you wouldn't normally have a chance to do.
So before I wrap up, I'm going to tell you one other great place to ask for materials. Uh, a lot of people don't know about the Junior Ranger program in the US and also the Explorer program in the Canadian National Parks. And a lot of the provincial parks have their own version as well. So if you're out in those natural spaces, uh, you want to ask for booklets. When we went to Jasper, we did the Explorer program there, and they even give you a little kit to go out and do science experiments at one station. There's all sorts of engagement, and it's different at every park. So that's the Explorers program in Canada. In the States, it's Junior Rangers, and that's a really good opportunity for virtual learning as well, because while we can't travel right now, some of the junior ranger badges are offered online or you can print off the books and mail it in and they'll send you your badge i don't think they're sending them out right now due to covid but eventually you'll get it but that's a great way to sort of virtually travel and once you're able to travel again all of the national parks but not just the national parks the national historic sites national monuments they all have junior ranger programs there are so many of them and then the states each individually, a lot of them will have their own state junior ranger programs. So as you go to the state parks and the national parks, make sure to ask for those things. All right, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. And if anybody has any questions, now's the time for that. Um, I will stick around here for five minutes or so, and then I'm going to hop over to Facebook and I'll be there to answer questions. I'll start a thread in the members group and put in links to things that I've talked about as we were going along here. And then also if you have any questions, you can put them in over there as well. But I will stay here for five minutes. I'm going to take some notes of things I want to send to everyone. And uh, if you have any questions, I'll look up every, every minute or two to see if anyone has any questions. <laughs> 